All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, my name is Nicole Cochran. For um, many of you who don't know me, because I'm fairly new to this this role at the U.S. Institute of Peace, so um, it's nice to to see all your faces. Um, here we, you know, we work to contribute to the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of violent conflict. And one of the ways that we do that is providing a platform um, for knowledge exchange about peace and security issues around the world. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today, um, both online and, and in person, um, to discuss the recently released report, um, How Do We Survive in the Future? Atrocity Crimes in Kareni State. Um, this report was the result of a joint partnership um, between the Kareni Human Rights Group, the Cayenne Women's Organization, the Kareni National Women's Organization, Kaya State Peace Monitoring Network, the U.S. Campaign for Burma, and the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. So today's topic is incredibly important. Um, this report documents serious violations of international human rights and humanitarian law in Kareni State. Since the attempted coup on March 1st, 2021, the Burmese junta have committed widespread um, destruction of civilian property, arbitrary arrests, torture, sexual violence, mass killings, um, and others on innocent civilians. And the junta is not showing any signs of slowing down. So if the current trend continues, things will only get worse for the Kareni people. Um, before we begin, I'd like to touch on a few housekeeping points. Um, first, we are recording the session so that it can be shared and, and distributed by the partners and their networks. Um, there will be a time for audience Q&A um, towards the end of the moderated panel discussion, so we ask that you hold your questions. Um, for those of us who are joining online, um, please use the raise your hand function and come off mute when our, our moderator asks you to. Um, we will not be monitoring the chat, unfortunately. Um, but with that, I will pass it on to our experts, Nene Plo, Karen Ames, Rachel Fleming, and our moderator and ambassador, Kelly Curry, um, who will be moderating the discussion today. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm going to, um, sorry, I, I apologize for holding everybody up. And I was looking for my my bios here, and for whatever reason, they for some reason are not here. So I'm hoping they end up doing. Thank you. So I'm going to briefly introduce our our speakers who um, who have have agreed to join us here today, and of course Rachel online, and then they're going to give about five minutes of remarks each, and then we'll um, do a little bit of moderated Q and A after that. And, um, and then turn it open to audience questions. So um, our first speaker is going to be Nene Po, who is from the coordination team for emergency relief with the Kareni National um, Progressive Party, which provides humanitarian assistance. And he's been working on that since the coup. Um, he has served as the spokesperson for the KNPP's Peace Negotiation Committee from 2018 until February 1st, 2021. And before that, um, from 2016 to 2022, he provided technical assistance and peace negotiations to the UNFC, which was um, working to with the uh, on the ceasefire and um, national uh, the NCA the national ceasefire agreement. Um, Karen Ames is the managing director of the U.S. Campaign for Burma. She's worked on advocacy and raising awareness, including working with youth from the Burmese diaspora um, on the ongoing human rights violations in uh, Myanmar over, for over a decade. She's also a contributing author for the publishing company ABC CILO and holds a master's degree in Southeast Asian studies with a focus on democracy and women's rights from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Rachel Fleming is an independent human rights consultant with extensive experience in human rights research and legal analysis on accountability for war crimes and crimes against humanity in Myanmar. She's worked um, with the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, which many of us know very well, as well as the Chen Human Rights Organization, which is another very well-known and well-regarded organization. And she currently is still on their board of directors. She holds a master's degree in human rights law from the University of London. So I'm thrilled to have this great panel. 
Rachel also worked on the report and Karen has been working to help raise awareness around this report and, and has been traveling around with Nano this week while he's been in Washington talk, um, for, the, for the launch. So thank you also to USIP for hosting this important launch event. I forgot to mention that. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Nene to get us started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm actually very touched uh, to see all of you and for your attention uh, and for your support. Uh, usually, uh, the issue of Korean is not mentioned, uh, let alone at the uh, international level, uh, not even in uh, the Burmese uh, uh, level. Uh, but you know, uh, with this report and uh, all the support that I'm seeing now, uh, and I'm very touched and uh, very appreciative too. Uh, for this event, I guess uh, I'm just the tip of uh, the iceberg uh, for this report to, help, to happen. Uh, my role in the report uh, uh, was very limited. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the groups that are listed on the report uh, who were actually doing uh, majority of the work uh, on the ground, uh, writing and editing and compiling everything. I just come here and uh, you know, uh, in, in Burmese, we say, uh, nam fiu, you know, we just spray uh, sesame seeds, uh, uh, you know, on whatever uh, the food is. Uh, but, you know, uh, nevertheless, uh, very uh, thankful for uh, uh, this opportunity and uh, also, <clears throat> you know, uh, expect uh, some good questions uh, from you. Uh, and I think uh, that will be my opening remark. Thank you. Good afternoon with everyone. I'm happy to be here to share this most important report and get this information out there. Um, just a little bit of context and as to how this report came about. And it really boils down to two reasons. Um, first of all, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the Christmas Eve massacre and our Karani partners were um, disappointed with how fleeting the information was covered in the news. Um, it was a very short period of time, over a couple of days before it was phased out. And they thought, given the severity of the event, it would have had much more coverage. Um, the second reason, um, and this was conversations with our Karani partners, um, in which larger NGOs that were releasing reports would come to them um, asking for assistance, uh, to get the necessary information and data that was needed and taking them into high risk areas. But unfortunately, when those reports were, re were released, um, our crediting partners were not credited, unfortunately. So this report, like Nini Plo said, was written, um, the data collected by our Karani party. So it truly is a report written by the Karani for the Karani. And I think that was that's the biggest takeaway um, aside from the information that is provided within this report. So I, uh, Rachel, did you want to add a few more? Why don't we go ahead to Rachel? Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Actually, I, maybe I will hand it back to Karen because I think it would be great, Karen, if you could talk a little bit more about the context on the ground in Kareni State and some of the key mm -hmm. findings of the report and statistics, and then I can come in with the legal perspective after that. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Um, so a bit of context. So Kareni State is a very small geographic state on eastern border on east on the eastern side of Burma. Um, before the coup, or attempted coup, I should say, uh, there, there was a history of human rights violations. And with this report, um, it documents uh, the increased human rights violations and the intensity that is committed within the state. And that is um, one of, and another key takeaway is the, the intensity because of how much of an impact it does have on the current civilians. And this report does cover from May, 2021, to September 2022. Some of the key findings include serious violations of international human rights and humanitarian law, uh, some of which uh, that's committed by the junta forces is the indiscriminate and targeted attacks on the civilian population, murder and mass killings, widespread destruction of civilian property, arbitrary arrest and detention, torture and cruel treatment, forced labor, human shields, 
and then forced displacement on a massive scale. When I say massive scale, the, our Kareni partners documented at least over 180,000 IDPs within Kareni state and neighboring areas as considered historic Kareni land. So a, a good portion of the Kareni population outside of the Kareni borders are included in the numbers that we do present in this report. So the 180,000, that's about 40% of the total population. And 70% of that is women and children. And then the cause, of course, is the repeated attacks on IDB camps, civilian areas, um, villages, wards, towns. Um, it does not exclude uh, attacks on protected areas, such as religious structures. Um, we have documented airstrikes. More than six uh, civilians were killed, three of which are children. Um, Four have been killed by landmines, seriously injuring over 70 Kareni civilians. We have documented at least more than 65 Kareni civilians to be forced to be porters and human shields. 260 were arbitrarily arrested with 33 being women, 115 killed in military custody. So the severity that's happening of, of the crimes on the ground, it, it, it truly is impacting the people and specifically the people um, with the, the four cuts that's being employed the, by the Burmese junta. They're, they're specifically targeting the civilians, clearly from the data from this report, um, cutting food, um, intelligence, um, access to just the basic human, human rights. And this is all documented with within the report itself. Now, um, Rachel, why don't we have you come in and talk a little bit about some of the legal aspects of the findings in the report? Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Karen. That was really helpful. Um, yeah, just to add to the, my word to say that it's been an absolute privilege to work with the four Kareni organizations. Um, I'm very honored to support their efforts to seek justice, accountability, and increased humanitarian aid on behalf of their communities. So my role was simply to do the legal analysis of the data collected for the report, which the Kreni organizations themselves analyzed, you know, they wrote the report, I just came in to do the, the legal analysis. So the key message here on legal analysis is that it is very reasonable to conclude that, Bur that members of the Burmese military have committed both war crimes and crimes against humanity in Kareni state and the neighboring areas. So as a reminder for us all, war crimes are serious violations of international humanitarian law and spe specific acts um, which are prohibited in the context of an internal armed conflict are set out in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And when perpetrated in the context of an internal armed conflict and with the necessary intent and knowledge of the act and the context, those acts amount to war crimes. So as Karen has briefly touched on, the acts amounting to war crimes described in the report include attacking civilians. The first point to make about this is that attacking civilians under um, the Rome Statute doesn't necessitate that civilian homes are destroyed or that civilians are killed. It simply requires that the force um, directed that attack against a civilian population, which they did unequivocally. And when it results in deaths of civilians, then it becomes the war crime of murder, which is also documented in the report. So we have the war crimes of attacking civilians, attacking protected objects, in this case, churches and medical facilities, murder, torture, cruel treatments, and displacing civilians in Kareni state. And very importantly, the conduct of the Burmese military documented in this report likely also meets the higher legal threshold for crimes against humanity. So those are among the gravest crimes under international law committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against any civilian population. And as a reminder for us all, an attack doesn't need to be a military attack, 
but instead refers to a course of conduct involving the commission of prohibited acts. So again, the perpetrator must have knowledge that the conduct is part of that attack against the civilian population. So specifically, the conduct of the Burmese military documented in the report likely also constitutes the crimes against humanity of imprisonment or arbitrary deprivation of liberty. As Karen already mentioned, 260 Kareni civilians arbitrarily arrested and detained. Murder, 115 civilians unlawfully killed in military custody. Torture, several of those deaths in military custody occurred as a result of be people being tortured to death. The crime against humanity of enslavement with reference to forced labor and other inhumane acts with reference to the use of human shields, um, which is this is when the Burmese military haven't abducted civilians, as Karen mentioned, at least 65 civilians, including women and children, in order to serve as human shields to protect them from the threat of attacks by Kareni resistance forces. And lastly, the forcible transfer of population, what we might also call forced displacement. So just to unpack that a bit further, what is happening in the Kareni context and documented in this report is really a microcosm of what is happening across the country. So as well as local human rights groups and other civil society organizations, the UN Special Rapporteur, the IIIM, Amnesty International and so on, have all pointed out that killings and other abuses committed against civilians during post-coup repression are part of a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population. And as Karen put it, you know, in the Kareni context, if we just focus purely on that, a small geographic area, you know, um, when it comes to crimes against humanity, a widespread spread attack has been defined by the International Criminal Court as either an attack carried out over a large geographical area or an attack in a small geographical area directed against a large number of civilians. So in the Kareni context, we have 180,000 civilians displaced. And when we look at the pattern of conduct by the Burmese military documented in the report, we can see that civilian forces have attacked, sorry, junta forces have attacked civilians from the air and from the ground. They have occupied villages for the purposes of setting up military outposts, and they have bulldozed homes in order to do that. This is all described in great detail in the report. And when the military retreat from villages, because it's no longer militarily expedient for them to be there, they typically burn down homes in arson attacks as they retreat, and they lay landmines around the villages. So more than 1,000 homes have been severely damaged um, by these kinds of attacks, mortar shelling, arson attacks, and at least half of those have been completely destroyed. So this is a systematic pattern of conduct by the military which drives civilians from their homes, and not only that, but the use of landmines, the extensive use of landmines makes it dangerous for them to return. And this is why this conduct amounts to the force, the crime against humanity of forcible transfer of population. So again, just to repeat, the key message is that based on the findings of the report, it's reasonable to conclude that the military have committed both war crimes and crimes against um, humanity in Kareni state and neighboring areas. And also lastly, that the US and the wider international community has both a legal and a moral duty to respond to those atrocity crimes. So I'll leave it there, back to you, Ambassador Curry. thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so to, to get to the discussion, I'd actually like to start with you, Nene. Um, we've heard from, from Karen and Rachel about the, some of the general nature and the findings in the report about crimes against humanity and war crimes um, committed by the Burma army against the Karani people. Um, we also know that this is not a new phenomenon, that for more than 70 years, the, the Burma army has, has waged war against ethnic people and has committed atrocities against ethnic people. Um, what would you say, if anything, is, is different um, in this post-coup um, in the in the effort to put down the the resistance to the military coup, 
and how the the military is is responding to that situation in Karani State and the difference for the Karani people on the ground. Thanks, Ambassador Kelly, for the question. I think uh, the the difference now after the coup is uh, uh, the skill, the skill of the uh, the operation and the violation. <clears throat> Uh, in, in the before the coup, you know, uh, there was displacement uh, among Korean communities, uh, but you will see it uh, mostly uh, along the border and uh, mostly uh, on, uh, you know, on, on the Thai side of the border uh, in refugee camps. And we have some uh, IDPs, uh, you know, uh, deep inside the state, but you know, not many people know about that. But you know, with uh, with this time, you know, at this time, you know, uh, one hundred and eighty thousand people displaced. That that is almost uh, half of the the population of Kranny. Uh, Kranny uh, only have about four hundred thousand people, and, and that includes the Kranny population who lives outside of Kranny State. And now, you know, uh, forty percent of uh, those are are being displaced. So that's the scale, uh, uh, much much larger scale of displacement, and also uh, the uh, you know the attacks. Uh, it's a lot more uh, intensive now, intensified. Uh, for example, in the past, uh, the Burmese military would attack uh, Korean resistance, but they will rarely use airstrikes. Uh, and they will rarely, uh, they will use mortars attack, but uh, unless, you know, it is for, say, uh, to take a, a position or to, to overrun a, a Korean resistance position. But now we're seeing frequent airstrikes airstrikes you know sometimes just to clear their way you know they would they would launch an airstrike or and and we see a lot of mortar attacks uh mortar attacks again is to clear their way you know for a convoy to move uh somewhere or to just you know terrorize the people uh or to to make it impossible for the people to return and you know sometimes you know they would they will shell these uh, mortar rounds in the middle of the night sometimes early in the morning when people don't expect it uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, as a good night call, you know, because uh, some IDPs, uh, internally displaced people, uh, would sarcastically joke that they can't sleep at night if they cannot hear, if they don't hear the mortar shells, uh, because they're so used to with the, you know, the uh, the uh, the noises. Uh, but you know, the unlucky ones will, will be hit uh, and then uh, killed. Uh, so uh, that uh, that's uh, the difference uh, that we see now. And also, uh, uh, since the coup, uh, Karani State is, uh, you know, I mean, the, uh, uh, because of the displacement, I would say uh, more than half of the state is empty, you know, empty in terms of, uh, you know, say population in towns like Dimoso, Puso are no longer there anymore. They all have to uh, flee uh, and uh, they are in hiding now. Uh, either in the jungle or they flee to the uh, relatives or friends in some other towns or, or some other states uh, or, or region. So, you know, these towns become, have become, you know, ghost towns, uh, ghost town. And, uh, and another problem is uh, restriction of uh, movement uh, of the people uh, because of uh, the attacks, because of landmines, and because of the random patrol uh, by uh, the uh, the Burmese military, you know, people will, will not dare to go out. Uh, and if they must go out, they go out with much risk, uh, risk of being attacked, uh, risk of being uh, 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 attacked, being arrested, and risk of standing, uh, stepping on landmines and, and such. So, you know, it restricts a lot of movement and there affects uh, th their livelihood too, you know. Uh, some need to go back to their villages to fetch uh, their leftover rice, for example, or to look after their livestock uh, and, you know, uh, you know still, uh, they will risk uh, a lot of dangers. Uh, and uh, another problem, unlike before, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, the fact that a lot of the areas that are displaced now are actually the rice bowl of Kranji State. Uh, Dimoso Township, Puzo Township uh, produced uh, a lot of uh, rice in the past. Uh, th th these areas are where you have rice fields. And peop uh, most Kranji pe uh, people are farmers. Uh, we, we, we would either farm rice or different kinds of beans or corns, but currently uh, these areas uh, you know, are abandoned and we, we just uh, cannot uh, farm anymore. And all, all of these uh, IDPs are moving to the mountains or the jungles and 
you know, uh, it has become a lot of burden from the, the host communities too. Uh, a lot of the communities in the, ja in, in the jungles or in the mountains uh, practice uh, slash and burn uh, agriculture technique, uh, which is very limited in terms of producing uh, the crops. But now they have to feed uh, uh, the IDPs uh, in, in arriving in the area. So yeah, that impact on the population is something that we did not see uh, before. Um, and I just to follow up really quickly that because these areas are being abandoned, do you see any effort by the um, by the junta or the forces to take that land? Because we know that one thing that often happens is that when the north the historic residents of an area leave, the um, the military hunter moves in and seizes that land under the vacant fallow um, uh, laws that that allow them to to take land. So this is compounding the problem with land seizures in many areas. Is this happening also in Karani? Uh, at this point, I would say, I ironically, luckily, uh, 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 the military junta cannot do that uh, because uh, the uh, you know, in areas that are abandoned right now, they cannot come and say uh, position themselves uh, just yet because of the resistance movement. Uh, in current state, we do have very strong resistance uh, uh, against the junta right now. So they will at most only have an outpost or a few outposts uh, on strategic uh, areas uh, or on, on the road, but not to a point that they can claim land or they can, you know, take over farms and homes like they have done in, say, for example, in Kachin state. Uh, they cannot do uh, do that at this point. So, uh, you know, I would say that's lucky, but it's it's in in a very sad context. That, that is that is certainly one of the things that is different in this context is that the resistance is thwarting the ability of the the military to do that. Um, turning to you, Rachel. Um, what we're hearing, as you as you noted, is very serious crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, and I want to zero in um, on what Nene was saying about the use of the intentional targeting of civilian populations with fixed wing aircraft, um, artillery, and and mines and landmines. Can you talk a little bit about where that you know how that how that factors into your um, analysis, your legal analysis on war crimes and crimes against humanity? Yeah, I think um, what one thing that was really striking and the way in which we I came to this kind of conclusion about war crimes and crimes against humanity is that the groups were very careful to check and ask whether there was, for example, an armed resistance group in the area or whether there had been active conflict so that we could distinguish between what was possibly an indiscriminate um, attack on civilians, which is still a violation of international humanitarian law, right? And a deliberate attack on civilians, which is a war crime. And it was very striking that in the vast majority of the cases documented in the report, there was no active fighting. There was, you know, uh, no armed group at, in present at that time. So then we can see that that constitutes then a more of a deliberate attack on civilians. And in some cases, you know, civilians were describing how the military used drones to fly over the area the day before when they were in IDP camps. And then as Nene described so eloquently there, you know, they come and strike at night. Um, or first thing in the morning when people are sleeping. So it's to inflict the maximum damage. So, you know, if you have a military that's got the use of um, high tech drones that can survey an area and can see very clearly the difference between what is an IDP population and what is an armed resistance group. So I don't think we should be in, a, in any doubt about that. And I, would, I really want to praise the groups for their diligence and how they went about doing the research to, to determine that, you know, because it's an important point. Um, so I hope that that somewhat answers the question. Thank you so much. And Karen, um, I know that, as I mentioned, you've been talking about this report a little bit here in Washington um, since its publication with policymakers and interested audiences in the US government. And I assume that will be happening with other governments as well, or is already. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what some of the policy asks and, and things that um, other governments can do that, that you're focused on with this report and, and how they specifically link up to the findings in this report. 
<clears throat> so some of what we have been talking about in the last couple of days and in the coming days when we go to New York City um, will be the, the importance of coordinated action, uh, specifically with sanctions. Um, each country has that has put forth sanctions have done so, but not in a coordinated effort. So it's very disjointed. And in order to make a more impactful change or uh, more impactful in terms of uh, justice and accountability when it comes to the Burmese junta, um, every the country's leadership really need to come together uh, within the international community to put forth something that we'll see more change than what we have been seeing in the last two years. So this is where we're coming to different offices, different policymakers um, about coming together in a coordinated effort and specifically asking US leadership to take on that role to co come together, bring everyone together in order to implement these strong targeted actions. Ooh, sorry, sorry, <clears throat> strong targeted actions um can you repeat the second part of the question <laughs> i'm sorry fine <laughs> actually i think i want to ask all three of you um one of the things that i know in the report and and in the advocacy that you're calling for is this um issue around aviation um or jet fuel and why is that a particular i mean obviously with the use of fixed wing aircraft against civilian populations that that is is a big part of it but what is it specifically about jet fuel that a you think um can can be accomplished in terms of sanctions and be um are are there any concerns about um for instance the effect on humanitarian assistance or other economic um negative potential effects from cutting off either jet fuel specifically or more broadly um going after the the military's ability to import certain products and make, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, it is very important uh, that we, we take action uh, against jet fuel and particularly uh, military jet fuel. Uh, uh, because uh, at, you know, so far, uh, the airstrike is the, the most lethal weapon of the uh, Burmese military right now. It, it comes without warning and it comes very fast. Uh, it can take longer for a, uh, a, a unit to assemble a mortar attack, you know, put everything together. It, it can take longer than uh, to send a, a jet from Tongu to Luego, for example. It can take only 30 minutes to 15 minutes and the jet, you know, we, uh, we arrive to uh, like on an attack. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, so that's why it is very little. And you know, uh, and also you know, it, it instills uh, a lot of fear uh, uh, among the people. Uh, the uh, you know, the uh, especially those in hiding. You know, just hearing the sound of a plane uh, will terrorize them already, or uh, with or the the trauma that they already have. So that's why I think uh, it is very important that uh, we we you know we we take action uh, in that area. But I know I, I know I understand uh, that you know if we take broad action on jet fuel, it might affect uh, aviation fuel, uh, civilian uh, side uh, as well. But you know, I as far as I understand, uh, you know, uh, the the suppliers and uh, even the Burmese military itself, uh, you know, they they do segregate the use of fuel, you know, for civilian purpose and for uh, uh, military purpose. And there, there uh, the the Amnesty International report finds that the the Burmese military actually breach the agreement, cross over to the civilian side and take the fuel for civilian use and use it for military use, uh, but with no consequence, you know, with no action uh, uh, against uh, such things. So I think, you know, uh, we can be creative uh, here uh, and do something to enforce uh, that, that kind of uh, crossover uh, use of uh, uh, the uh, jet fuel uh, cannot happen. And if, if it happens, uh, that there's some like serious actions uh, against the, the Burmese military. So that's one thing. And another thing is, uh, you know, if we cut jet fuel, for example, uh, it might affect uh, delivery of humanitarian aids. Uh, uh, as far as I know, we don't have any humanitarian aid uh, being delivered by uh, planes now, uh, not even by helicopters yet. Uh, uh, there are some 
groups based on the border uh, who are who are currently uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, coming out with this idea of delivering uh, uh, assistance with drones, you know, not 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 planes, because we don't have uh, you know airports or, or helipads or anything like that. So drones, but drones will be different. You no, know, we won't use uh, jet fuel for drones. Uh, so you know, so it won't uh, affect the the delivery of humanitarian aid uh, at this point. And uh, we, you know, we also advocate for cross-border, uh, you know, uh, assistance. So cross-border, in particularly for the case of Kareni and other states uh, on the eastern side of uh, uh, Burma, it will be cross-border will be, you know, uh, uh, land crossing, and, and you know, we will likely use trucks, uh, pickup trucks, or other kinds of trucks, and they will not require jet fuel either. So that's why I think, you know. Uh, we we should uh, consider very seriously uh, sanctioning jet fuel, particularly military uh, jet fuel. Thank you. Rachel, same question to you about both policy recommendations and the more specific broadly and then more specifically about the jet fuel issue. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, just to uh, add on to what uh, Nene Plo was saying there. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a red herring to to think that humanitarian aid might be negatively affected by sanctioning jet fuel. Um, Nene Plo already described how how things happen on the border, but even you know international humanitarian organisations and UN agencies they're not using flights to deliver humanitarian aid. They sometimes use air transport for the movement of some of their staff and so on. But in terms of the actual delivery of humanitarian aid, it's done by road is my understanding. And most of the country is accessible by road. I don't mean to say it's easily accessible. <laughs> That's definitely not the case, but it is accessible. And as Nene has already described, when it comes to the hard to reach displaced populations in border areas like Kareni State, the best way is by cross-border aid, and that needs to be done overland or perhaps creatively with, with drones. Um, so when it comes to sanctioning aviation fuel, yeah, the, the coordination issue is really important. The UK government, as some of you will know, recently imposed sanctions on two companies and two individuals associated with what is known as the Asia Sun Group, which is viewed as integral to the aviation fuel industry in Burma. Um, and they are specifically mentioned in the report that Nene was talking about, uh, Deadly Cargo by Amnesty International, which describes the deadly impact of the supply of aviation fuel, but also the supply chain issues, right? And then Canada also prohibited the export sale and supply of aviation fuel to the regime in line with a key recommendation from Amnesty. But those are two states, you know, we really need the coordinated effort to go you know, we need sanctions to go further and faster with greater coordination to cut fuel, weapons and cash to the regime. Um, one other point I just want to make on airstrikes is that they have escalated since the UN Security Council resolution was passed in December last year. And they are ongoing against civilian populations, including IDP sites in Kareni areas in January, right? So you know, airstrikes do contravene point one of that resolution. And just to remind us all, it says the UN Security Council demands an immediate end to all forms of violence throughout the country and urges restraint and de-escalation of tensions. I think we can all agree that the use of airstrikes against civilian populations is an escalation rather than a de-escalation. So one of our calls is, is that, again, echoing what Karen said about the US showing leadership there are a number of things that could be done, right? So we know that the UK is the pen holder on Burma at the UN Security Council, but the US could work with the UK to try and convene a special emergency session at the UN Security Council, particularly to discuss um, ongoing airstrikes against civilians in Burma. And that hopefully we would see, uh, you know, a strong binding resolution put forward for a vote. Um, regardless of whether there might be a, a veto, you know, and that should include 
comprehensive arms embargo and um, including on aviation fuel to the military. So I'll maybe talk about the recommendations on justice and accountability a bit later, but those are the points to make just now. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Karen, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, Nene Po and, <clears throat> and Rachel brought up some really good points. I know just based on conversations that we had with Karani partners that they do prefer and greatly urge the international community to put sanctions on aviation fuel. Um, I mean, within the report itself, they have documented airstrikes and the impacts of those airstrikes. But like Rachel pointed out, just in the last couple of weeks in January, there have been attacks on IDP camps. Luckily, um, some of those camps were, due to early warning, were able to evacuate or leave the area. Um, but that does not mean that's going to happen every time. So sanctions on aviation fuel would be favored, especially for the Karani partners. Um, speaking of our Karani partners here, I want to ask Nene one one final question, and then we'll open it up. Um, when when Rachel will will ask Rachel to talk about justice mm -hmm. and accountability, but how important is that piece of this for the Karani communities? Um, and is this something that you're already working on? despite being in the midst of an armed conflict right now. And, and can you talk a little bit about that, at the what it means at the community level? Sure, thank you. Uh, if international community cannot sanction jet fuels, uh, give us missiles. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, well, you know, it's a serious joke. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, in terms of justice, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know the international community, you know, do need to show efforts uh, in terms of, you know, uh, bringing uh, justice uh, to uh, to the this military uh, regime. Uh, uh, so so that you know uh, the, the people you know we you know will be encouraged and motivated, and so that people know that oh you know they they do have friends, you know they have people who who've got their backs. Uh, so that's uh, important. Uh, but on the ground, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know um, helping with uh, justice, uh, you know we do work with uh, the the IWM uh, on the ground uh, uh, to collect uh, evidence, uh, as, especially after the Christmas Eve mass massacre of uh, 2021. Uh, that's when uh, more than uh, three uh, th thirty people uh, were uh, burnt alive by the uh, the SEC. Uh, the Burmese military. So uh, uh, from then, uh, you know, we, you know, we've been collecting uh, uh, different kinds of evidence, uh, including uh, interviews and uh, other sort of uh, evidence uh, in collaboration with uh, the BIWM and all, uh, you know, with uh, our humanitarian networks uh, on the ground. Uh, but uh, you know, our partners, uh, especially the human rights uh, defenders uh, on the ground, uh, have also, uh, you know, mentioned about uh, a lot of constraints, especially, especially in terms of funding uh, supports uh, uh, in order to do, you know, uh, their job on the ground. For example, this report, you know, a very important re report, took may like many months or, you know, uh, quite a long time uh, to come uh, to come about uh, because, you know, uh, of uh, of so many uh, uh, challenges, including uh, funding and the lack of resources, you know, uh, uh, in terms of human or or others. So, you know, uh, and I uh, know a, a friend of mine uh, who is also a human rights defender. Uh, you know, he he said, and he said quite rightly that, you know, a, a lot of the time you will hear supports, uh, you know, for human rights and such and such uh, are announced, right? But you know, actually, these supports. Uh, you know, do not come to uh, the actual human rights uh, human rights defenders on the ground uh, very much. Not not much. You know, very very limited amount uh, only. So uh, that create uh, uh, challenges for them on on the ground. You know, to collect uh, data and to report and you know, to assess uh, uh, international community. You know, to present uh, uh, this kind of reports. And you know, another example is uh, you know myself now. You know, I have these amazing friends on the ground uh, doing great jobs, you know, collecting data and everything. It should be them who are sitting here now and then you know, telling the world. But because, you know, there's, there's no mechanism to support them to come over here, uh, you know, as human rights, human rights defenders and, you know, tell the world what is happening in, in, in our country, you know. So, you know, that's probably, 
another area of uh, support that we can consider for human rights and human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you, Nene. That's really important. Um, Rachel, did you have anything specific you wanted to mention regarding justice and accountability mechanisms and efforts that are underway that could that could use the information gathered in this report? Yes, I um, definitely. I think there's a few different things, but just to get really specific and to build on what Nene said, um, yeah, one of the recommendations in the report is to increase support for human rights documentation work and to couple that also with psychosocial support, right? So one of the challenges that groups were having was that when they do this research, they're very aware of the impact it has in terms of the risk of re-traumatization for victims of human rights violations. So to conduct this support, it would be so great if they could, as well as having the resources to do the research, to actually support the victims with very much needed psychosocial support. So that's one step. And then also to, to provide practical financial support to groups like the four groups that we've been working with to bring forward cases under universal jurisdiction principles. So I think most of us know, but just to to explain for anybody that doesn't. That's the legal principle that some crimes are so heinous that they should be, they can and should be tried in any country where those crimes um, are enumerated under domestic legislation. So there are various groups, including I know the Kareni Human Rights Group have expressed interest in taking forward universal jurisdiction cases specifically on what's happening on the grounds in Kareni state. But to do that, they need financial support, they need technical support. So that would be a very practical thing. That's, um, you know, groups want to be proactive. They're tired of waiting for the slow, very, very slow wheels of justice, you know, and they've seen other groups take the lead on this, specifically the Burmese Rohingya Organization UK that lodged a, um, a similar case in Argentina that's making its way through the courts now. So there's a precedent, you know, so I think it would just be really great to support the efforts of, of groups like KNHRG and the other three groups that took part in this report. Thanks. Karen, do you have anything to add on that point? Um, Nene Bowen and Rachel brought up good points on supporting human rights defenders. Um, another way to help support, and this goes into um, expanding into support for the IDPs is you know, providing humanitarian support that's much needed on the ground. In past conversations, um, it, there, it has been brought up that supplies and aid will run out in six months time. So providing the, the food supplies, clean water, access to medical care, that is deeply, deeply needed within those camps um, and providing those resources to the human rights defenders or directly to partners on the ground to disperse that aid to the impacted communities of vulnerable po populations it is desperately needed. And I think I just wanted to bring up that point. Thank you. Um, so I think now we can go ahead and open things up to questions. Um, and so I guess I'll just, uh, I see one already. So please go ahead and you um, press the button on your microphone. And so the, the people online can hear you when you're talking. Yes. Um, oh, and please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you so much. My name is Bina Nepram and I'm from Manipur in Northeast of India, across the border, but I'm now currently a senior advisor at USIP on indigenous issues. So um, just a point in terms of uh, point number seven in your key recommendation, I just wanted to do, because the, the, some of the things in which the conflict is ongoing and brutal is, as you said, the, the bombings from aircrafts, as well as um, those uh, committed by arms. And, in point number seven, I'm aware that China and Russia are some of the major suppliers of the arms there. And China in 2018 has signed the International Arms Trade Treaty. So under that, you can actually hold China accountable. We were very surprised when China signed the Arms Trade Treaty, but it is now a signatory and you can actually get China uh, in, because under that arms trade treaty, you cannot transfer weapons to another country, which was going to have a serious human rights violation. So I just wanted to bring them. The other thing is in terms of, I wanted to know if your group has been engaging the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, 
because the Karene people, so many groups in, in, in Burma are indigenous. And under Article 30 of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, you cannot militarize or commit acts of violations by military on indigenous territories. So I just wanted, and finally, my point is, India, are you engaging India on this? Um, because India as the world's largest democracy have a moral and ethical stand regarding the support. Just wanted to know if your groups have been engaging. Thank you. So I'll let you start with that, Nene. Take it away. Uh, thank you for the information and for the uh, question to uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as for the in indigenous rights uh, uh, thing, uh, uh, I'm not sure if any group uh, from Kraini State uh, has been engaging uh, on that issue, uh, and particularly uh, since the coup and in this, uh, the context that we're talking about now, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of any engagement uh, uh, just yet. But I think before before the coup, uh, some environmental groups uh, might in, might have engaged already on you know environmental issues related to in, indigenous people. Uh, yeah, so you know, uh, to answer your question, uh, I I don't know uh, yet uh, at this point, and and with India, uh, you know, uh, as for Kareni people and other uh, ethnic people uh, on the eastern side of uh, the country, you know, we we have not engaged with uh, uh, India government, Indian government on humanitarian issues, uh, but there are some uh, you know uh, political groups or ethnic resistance groups, uh, you know, they uh, they are trying to engage with. Uh, Indian government uh, on on the you know, the whole uh, uh, issues of our country, uh, but you know uh, our our brother and sisters on the west side of the uh, the country, you know because of their uh, proximity to in India, you know uh, you know they uh, you know they do have engagement with uh, a a Indian uh, uh, government and especially uh, Manipuri uh, government and you know other uh, states uh, on on the border area. And you know because uh, that area is, is important. Northeastern India is very important, uh, especially when we talk about uh, cross-border humanitarian, humanitarian aids. See if those aids uh, come through Indian border. You know, it will have to come through uh, those uh, east, uh, uh, northeastern states, and that is important because it will reach the Chin people, uh, the displaced Chin people, as well as the people in Sagai and Magui, because the displacement. In Sagai and Magui are actually larger than uh, in uh, other parts of uh, some other parts of the the country, but they are kind of trapped inside that corner of uh, the country, and they they they're not near any border. So you know it, it is very uh, difficult to deliver humanitarian aids. But see, if any kinds of uh, humanitarian aids uh, do go to them, you know the the likely route will be uh, the Indian border. Uh, that's why uh, engagement will be uh, uh, important. And I think our brothers and sisters over there are already working on it. Thank you. Karen or Rachel, did you have anything to add on Bina's question? Yeah, I can add a little bit more. Um, luckily for me, um, I, I have the privilege of being a board member on the Chin Human Rights Organization. And actually, one of the very recent conversations that I've been involved with has been um, about Manipur because Manipuri civil society activists have been very strong in supporting the um, refugees that have fled into Manipur from uh, Burma. And many of them are coming from Sagaing and Magwe region as well as Northern parts of Chin state. Um, but as our speaker might be aware, the, the Manipuri chief um, state minister basically recently, very recently in the last couple of days, put out a Facebook post um, basically describing them as illegal immigrants and they're a scourge and so on. And so Manipuri civil society has been working with the Chin Human Rights Organization to basically come up with an advocacy strategy against that. And thankfully the Mizoram chief state minister has been very sympathetic and very welcoming to refugees in Mizoram. So that gives an avenue and some leverage that we can use with the, the Manipuri um, state minister. But also um, the Mizoram state minister Chief State Minister has been um, helping with the central Indian government to try and negotiate some of these conversations about cross-border aid and so on. So it's very encouraging to see the Manipuri civil society work with the, the Chin civil society to, to make progress on those issues. Yeah, thank you. So 
So I'm going to ask if we have any questions online. We'll go to the. Do we and you can use the raise hand function to um, let us know if you have a question. If not, I can take another one here in the room if uh, somebody's ready. All right, we'll go to this gentleman here. Um, Russell Westergaard from the Department of State. And uh, the question I have is that um, typically uh, forcing someone from their home, destroying their home, and then making it uh, impossible for them to return by landmines and those kind of things could be considered uh, ethnic cleansing. But yet I notice you haven't made that determination or suggest or talk about ethnic cleansing as a, a motivation uh, or as a factor on the ground. Is that something you considered? Um, and then my second question, I guess, for everyone is, uh, what do you think is the regime's motivation or goals in making these attacks? What are they trying to accomplish on the ground? Nene, I'll let you go ahead and start with that one. Yeah, um, <laughs> Maybe the last one. Well, uh, on uh, ethnic cleansing, I think uh, before the coup uh, and before the peace process uh, uh, over 10 years ago, I think uh, a lot of uh, ethnic movements, uh, you know, uh, talk about ethnic cleansings, and we actually labor the atrocities uh, and the oppression against us as uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, some groups uh, have even had even gone as far as you know, uh, labeling it as uh, genocide. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, we did not get uh, anywhere with that. So yeah, uh, a lot of the time, you know, uh, we 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 you know we uh, we we thought about that as uh, ethnic cleansings. Uh, but in this report, uh, I, I will leave that to uh, other legal experts uh, uh, here. Uh, but uh, on the motivation of the regime, uh, you know, I think uh, it, it's quite clear uh, they want to hold on to power and then they want to rule uh, by force and fear. So instilling fear in, in, in the population and, uh, you know, Forcing, uh, forcing the uh, the the population into submission, uh, so that they can rule and uh, remain in power uh, for the time be uh, for the time being. Uh, uh, they they do it in a very violent way, you know, shelling, killing everything. But at the same time, they are working on you know legitimizing their rule, like planning uh, an election, uh, getting uh, recognition from uh, the international community, uh, so that they can remain in power in a less violent way. Uh, currently uh, through violent way. So they are working on that. Uh, that's why, you know, it is important that uh, the international community uh, uh, deny that uh, uh, that chance uh, to uh, to the regime. Uh, you know, I, I think I might have to switch a little bit to the political, political sides here. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, uh, deny them the legitimacy that they, uh, they so crave for, you know. Uh, and then, uh, you know, because uh, you know, the, the, this regime is illegal, uh, in, illegal in a, any way possible, uh, how they, they came about and everything, you know, illegal, and uh, they are not legit, legitimate and they want legitimacy, but we have to uh, make sure that they don't get that. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, giving them legitimacy, sometimes, you know, uh, it can be very subtle, like, uh, for example, the, the ASEAN is having uh, uh, on, uh, on tabletop practice or something, right? Uh, among the ASEAN uh, military uh, uh, leaders. Uh, and United States who chaired that meeting with Thailand. And ASEAN invites the, the Burmese military. United States said, uh, no, it is ASEAN decision. See, so there's you no know, quite sort of, uh, you know, but you're, you're giving some recognition and legitimacy to that, you know, while the people are calling for, you know, you know, any any kind of uh, all kinds of boycotts uh, against this uh, uh, this military regime. So uh, those are you know some actions that we have to be uh, the international community have to be careful about and think about carefully, so that we can effectively deny uh, them the legitimacy uh, that they they crave for. Yeah. Thank you for that um, very helpful inter <laughs> response. Um, uh, Rachel, did you have anything to add on the specific issues of, of legality and around ethnic cleansing? Yeah, just very briefly, the, the reason we don't um, mention ethnic cleansing in the report is because there is no clear definition of ethnic cleansing and it's not described um, as a particular crime in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. I do think that um, persecution probably comes into many of the other crimes against humanity that we also document in the report. 
So usually the crime of persecution, um, you know, intersects with other crimes. Um, so that may well be a possibility in the Kareni context. And just one other point to make is that the collective punishment strategy, you know, the four cuts uh, strategy that the military employ, you know, ostensibly it's a counter insurgency strategy, but let's not make any mistake about it. It's collective punishment. Anybody who is um, Kareni of a certain age would be perceived, uh, assumed to be part of the resistance and would be treated as such regardless of whether or not they are without any due process of law. Um, so that's that's another point to make there. Thank you. And Rachel, just quickly, or Nene, whoever can answer this, just for the um, for those who are not Burma Wallas and maybe aren't familiar with the military's four cut strategy, could you talk a little bit and explain a little bit more about what that entails, or any of the three panels? Yeah, I can I can start because I'm glad Rachel uh, <laughs> mentioned four cuts. Uh, because uh, yeah, uh, the four cuts uh, is a strategy uh, or policy by the Burmese military. Uh, it started in the seventies, uh, uh, basically uh, to crush resistance movement. Uh, at that time, it would be the Korean resistance movement, Korean resistance movement across the country. And uh, the cuts are one: uh, cut uh, food food supply; two: cut uh, funding; uh, three: cut uh, information or in, in intelligence and full cut recruits. So uh, there's their uh, full cut uh, strategy. And it has been a, a, like, very effective, very effective uh, because, uh, you know, with this strategy, the full cut strategy, you know, like thousands of people have been displaced, you know, uh, you know, at one point, you know, along Thai Burma border, we had more than 200,000 refugees on the Thai side of the country and about uh, 400,000 IDPs inside, that is uh, in Moon State, Korean state, the Nindari division, uh, Korean state, Shan state. You know, so this is all due to uh, uh, the focus strategy. And it's also effective against resistance movement because you know it, cut, it cuts everything. So uh, as guerrilla folks, you know, we rely on people, we rely on villages, we rely on the jungle, uh, you know, everything like that. But with that cut, and it is indiscriminate, uh, uh, you know, it, it worked uh, quite in the favor of the Burmese military. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, that's why, you know, I think uh, in terms of strategy, we, the, inter we, uh, the resistant uh, and the, the people on the ground and the international community, at least we can counter with uh, what I call three cuts. Uh, three cuts, I did not come up with this. This is uh, part of our, our report. And it will be uh, first, cut the weapon, right? Cut the weapon. And number two, cut the cash. Number three, cut the impunity. So you know, if we can counter with three cuts, you no, know, we can we can we can add more cut if if we want. Uh, but you know, at least if we can start with these three cuts, you know, sometimes you know you know when we think about strategy, uh, uh things like this help. And uh, another thing is uh, <laughs> uh, this one I, I I came up with it uh, uh to effectively uh get rid of the military uh regime in our country. You know, this is uh, our end goal. You know, we we want the military regime out. And then we will build this uh, country uh, from the beginning uh, uh, together with every all, all the stakeholder. So I uh, know to to do this uh, uh, acronym helps. I think uh, when we think about strategy. So the first thing is we have to use all kinds of forces. That that would include military force because the people are doing it already now. Military force, political force, economic force. We use all forces against this uh, regime. So that's F. Another thing is uh, we undermine anything that the, uh, the, the, the military is doing now. Say the, the effort to get legitimacy, we have to undermine that. Their elections, we have to undermine that. Uh, so undermine everything they do, that's you. And then another one is we cut their supplies. I already mentioned about the three cuts. That's you, I think I see right? You and the, at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, we kick them out of politics once and for all and completely, that's key. So we have to do that, right? When we think about strategy, uh, you know, acronyms like this help. And I think this acronym is very good. And I came up with that last night. Yeah. 
I personally love this. I'm not sure it's a family fun, friendly programming here at USIP, but um, <laughs> I think this is fantastic. All right, um, on that question, anybody else? <laughs> I don't know how you follow that, um, Rachel or Karen or anybody else. Um, so I do we have any questions on from our online participants yet? Oh, this should be a good one, Michael Martin. And then we'll get to uh, Ko Winman who will be next. Okay, um, thank you very much for this presentation. It covers a lot of topics and a lot of interesting elements. Um, there's a couple, three things um, that come to my mind. One, I want to emphasize that India should also be held account in their continuing support for the military in military means. Um, and you did point out that the local governments are helpful, but certainly the Modi government hasn't been particularly helpful. Um, Rachel, specifically for you, um, I was wondering in your cooperation with the IIMM, as well as if you're cooperating with the ICC and the ICJ or the IJ Court of Justice, yeah, ICJ, uh, in terms of whether the documentation meets international standards for some potential um, trial or tribunal to be held in the future, because that has been a concern in the past. So um, whether or not this documentation that's going on is gonna meet those thresholds and standards and if you're working with them. Now, the other question having to do with provision of assistance, the Burma Act certainly does provide for that, as well as financial assistance for such efforts to gather evidence for potential tribunals in the future. Um, but on the humanitarian assistance, when I was traveling in the region in October, in some parts of the country, uh, Chin, for example, where I was, um, it's being provided largely in kind. They're moving goods and materials across the border with local support. Um, but when I spoke to the KNU, the Karen group, they're doing it mostly through money. They're just basically carrying money across the border and the local conditions are such that they can get the food, the water and other supplies they need from local markets. I was just wondering in the Kareni situation, given that it's particularly in the food belt, uh, and this might be for Nai Nai, um, um, more um, is this a situation where uh, it's going to have to be provided and in kind. And if so, um, my predilection is working with the EAOs and the PDFs is the proper way of trying to move it within country, uh, at least for providing security. And I was wondering if you had any comments on how such assistance delivery should be provided. And with that, I'll turn off my sound and I'll turn off my video. It's good to see you at least all virtually. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, well, in, in Korean state, we we cannot do in kind and we cannot carry cash either. Uh, so what we do is we we transfer cash online. You know, we do it a little bit high tech. Uh, uh, but you know, actually we we use uh hon, hondi, hondi system hondi, You know, so so we uh, a lot of uh, our, our activities in uh, for fundraising take place uh, outside of the state. And then we we would uh, you know get uh, the funding uh, to Thailand and from there we would uh, transfer uh, we will buy cha, uh, uh, the cha currency in in Saikarni State or as well as in as well in Burma and then we work with our partners on the ground to procure and deliver assistance to the IDPs. Uh, that's the only way because right now uh, it is very hard uh, to find cash uh, uh, the cha. Uh, currency uh, on the Thai side near our area, so you know even if we have uh, other currency to buy cha, we cannot we cannot uh, uh, find cha. And uh, our our border our border crossing points are uh, very limited too. Uh, and the only uh, crossing point where you have proper car roads are, are also controlled by the Burmese military. So. Uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, transport uh, supplies, uh, say rice or medicines or anything like that, uh, with tr trucks or anything. And uh, you know, to assess uh, the areas where most IDPs are uh, on food is also very uh, uh, difficult uh, because uh, uh, you know, for a healthy person to trek uh, from the border area all the way to where the IDPs are would take a week, uh, a week. So you know, uh, you know, only only you know uh people you know who who uh, who really need to go will go and they will travel very light so that's why we have to rely on uh you know the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the money transfer uh, uh method just a 
follow up on that specific point though. Um, have you seen, I know that the military was trying to, the SAC was trying to crack down on some of the money lending and money transfer Hyundai system activities, um, cracking down on mobile money and things like that. Um, has that disrupted your ability to get funds inside and be our um, markets, local markets operating to where once the funds are inside, I mean, you mentioned the food scarcity and the, the, the attacks and the abandonment of paddy fields. So what, I mean, is there, if people have cash, are they able to purchase goods? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Burmese military is crack, cracking down on that, uh, the money transfer thing. So that's why uh, people have to be, you know, uh, quite creative. Uh, and I probably should not go into their creativity here. Uh, uh, but, you know, a lot of them also have to flee already uh, and they flee and then they would just operate from uh, other uh, other areas. But with a uh, crack, uh, crackdown like that, you know, uh, you know, it, it creates uh, a lot of limitation uh, on our activities uh, in terms of procuring uh, uh, supplies. So uh, most of the uh, humanitarian organizations uh, are not able to do uh, to to buy or to go or you know uh, get things uh, on their own anymore because of of all the risks. So what we do now is we rely on uh, mer merchants, you know, traders, and then uh, we will sort of like contract them, and then they will take care of uh, you know uh, the business, and you know in one way or another we 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 get the the supplies uh, for them, but. You know, uh, there's uh, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, but you know, it it increases the price a lot. Uh, co women, I saw you down there at the end of the table raising your hand. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nanapla, for all your very comprehensive explanation of you know human rights abuses going on in the country and especially on the full cats and airstrikes. So my question is related to that full cats and airstrikes. You know, focus used to work, used to be working in the past when they were doing at the, they call the black area, uh, where, you know, they uh, regarded as a enemy area, right? So now they are doing the focus in the civilian area. I mean, Sakai, McWay, Karani included, like my call, the most officer, all these places that, um, I mean, um, so the pattern is now, I think it's different. So how do you see to, if it is, you know, really still working today in this uh, civilian area, uh, not the enemy area? And my second question will be, if it is working, um, so um, the airstrike is helping to the focus strategy or not? Are they really hitting the target most of the time? Uh, yeah, certain places, you know, they hit the target, like Anampa and Kachin. But most of the target, uh, I remember in Kaya, airstrikes were not hitting the people because people already moved out of all these places. For example, you know, when the, well, one of their main strategy points was occupied, I think it's in Dimoso or um, Mesalau, no? Mesalau Hill, very strategic uh, hill point. So they did a lot of air attack, but all the villagers were not there. So uh, my question relates to the martial law now that they are you know, posting um, in different areas. I would say like 15% of the country now uh, in terms of the townships, yeah. So will they be doing a focus there and also airstrike or what does it mean? What, um, yeah. Uh, needs to be, you know, um, prepared for that. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, to start with the full cut uh, strategy, uh, uh, you know, it the full cut strategy, uh, you know, in, in the past, and I, I think until now, the Burmese military would designate uh, the country, would slice the country into zones, uh, the color coded, you know, black zone. That means all resistance. They don't have any control over their zone, and the gray zone or brown zone, uh, that is where they have mixed, you know, control. Uh, resistance groups can come in and out, but nobody have, uh, nobody has a permanent uh, presence there. And then white zone, where the regime has complete control. Uh, so you no, know, in these three zones, they will practice uh, focus in, in in any zone, uh, as far as I know, because. 
uh, some see one of the cuts uh, cutting intelligence and or another cut, cutting recruits. These intelligence and recruits come from the white zone, you know, the so-called white zone. They will cut that too. And then, uh, uh, you know, cutting food, uh, for example, uh, you know, resistance movement uh, will rely on, uh, say, villages, all right, to get food. Uh, so they would cut that by displacing that whole village. They will be in the so-called dark zone. So, you know, it, it takes place, uh, it took place and it, it, it is taking place uh, ev everywhere in the country now. Uh, uh, but in Korean state, you know, I think uh, about 90% of Korean state is, uh, is a so-called dark zone already because the regime doesn't have uh, any, any control anymore. And then this strategy, the focus strategy, we also work in Sagain and uh, Magui. You know, I'm sure it will work because it, it is very easy for them. They, they don't have to discriminate between civilian and uh, you know, armed groups. They will just, you know, cut, 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 cut. So you know, very, very, very easy for them. So it will, it will work. Uh, uh, that's why you know, we need to counter with uh, different strategies. Uh, so there's uh, four cuts uh, and on martial law. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, martial law, they announced martial law to double down on the operation, right? And uh, it is not, and uh, to, to make it sound like before martial law, they had, you know, civilian law or whatever law and the country was uh, under control and that kind of thing. But, you know, Burma under military is always a martial law to me, you know, because, you know, under martial law, they, they can uh, they can take you to uh, court without, you know, a failed trial or anything. And uh, this military officer, we just decide everything uh, for you, hand out your sentence and, you know, boom, you're gone. Uh, that's martial law. But before martial law, without the announcement of martial law, that's how it has been done uh, by the military. So to us, the oppressed, you know, it doesn't make any difference. It, it, it just you know, sounds funny. And I think it is to trick, uh, you know, international community or people who don't really know uh, uh, the situation on the ground there, you know, uh, because of uh, all the disturbance or because of the resistance movement, they have to, you know, announce this place, uh, under uh, martial law and the military has to come and take care as if you know, there was you know a civilian rule in the past but you know it, it makes no difference so they're just doubling down on uh, uh on oppression and it, it is also another way of legitimizing their actions you know we are very concerned about this uh they're already arbitrarily arresting and killing people uh, without martial law so can you imagine with martial law you know what they will do well, I think that's the perfect uh, place to end our Q&A. Um, and so I want to give our panelists an opportunity to provide any closing remarks, any stray thoughts that they weren't able to express up to now. And um, I'll start with uh, with Rachel, if she has any has a couple has any wrap up comments she'd like to make. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of things. Um, one was the question on the, the double I, double M and the kind of um, the standards of documentation and so on. So I just wanted to address that. So my understanding is the way the double I, double M works is that they have their own evidentiary standards. They need to conduct their own investigations. So it's, and they would do their own interviews with it following their own procedures and process, regardless of what information it is that groups on the ground collect. So in a sense, what we're, what groups like um, the four Kareni groups are doing is the step before that. You know, it's, it's establishing, it's finding the evidence, looking at the cases to bring that to the attention of the IIIM, and then they would then conduct their own investigation. So the report, for example, it touches on the Christmas Eve massacre, um, but also it, it, it documents documents two other mass killing events that have happened, you know, in, in the time frame of the report. And the fact that the, the, the regime, part of their tactics, which again is kind of evidence that they know that they are committing these uh, atrocity crimes, is the, the degradation with which they, they treat the, the people that they kill. So in one case, six men, their bodies were disposed of in a well, and in another case, they, they tried to hide them in a sewage pit. You know, so these are the kinds of details that we can bring to the IIIM, but they will need to do their own investigation. And um, 
just on martial law, just is the thought that's kind of, I mean, I have many thoughts, but just the, my last point really about martial laws, I completely agree with Nene, it's like doubling down. Um, we shouldn't think for a moment that there's any veneer of rule of law in areas where there is no martial law, you know. But what is very concerning about martial law is it explicitly gives the local commander, in this case, the regional control command based in Loikal, the power to delegate to his local commanders under him absolute power to do basically whatever they want. And that does mean that there are increased risks for people in, for example, military detention centres. It's an even greater risk that they will be tortured to death. Um, there's no habeas corpus writ under martial law, which means the one small chance that families might have had to just kind of get proof of life by going to the police station and asking for the whereabouts of their relatives is gone, you know. So there are these small things that kind of make it a little bit more serious, but we should not confuse that with there being any kind of rule of law in areas where there is no martial law. So that's my last thought on that. Thank you. That was very, very helpful, Rachel. Karen? I think just going back to um, the recommendations that we have here on the executive summary, which are just the key recommendations. In the report itself, there are several different sections um, for recommendations that to, for such as like ASEAN, UN, international community to really truly consider on when moving forward, when it comes to taking any steps towards um, uh, implementing uh, targeted uh, it, it, targeted uh, sanctions, um, but also to also bring up like the Burma Act that was recently passed in December, and that would be a really great tool to start to implement. And I know it hasn't really gotten that far yet in terms of implementing, but that would be a great step forward, especially if the U.S. is going to consider taking on leadership and bringing together inter the international community and in implementing some kind of um, impactful action. And Nene, I will give you the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I actually saved the strategy that I came up with last night for last, but... <laughs> But since I already mentioned it, I'm not going to uh, repeat <laughs> because it's not uh, family family friendly. Uh, anyway, but on a serious note, uh, uh, you know, I'm very thankful for this event. And you know, we have seen uh, a lot of great reports. You know? This one, uh, the latest report that we have seen, the Amnesty International, International Report, very good. Uh, and the, uh, the UN Human Rights uh, Group Report, also very good, USIP Report. And so many reports, uh, so many reports. But I think uh, enough with reports. We, it's time for action. Uh, it's time for action. Uh, and I hope that you know all of us here uh, today, we can work together and come up with uh, concrete uh, action plans uh, for the people of Burma, not just for Karenni people, but for the people of Burma for for a real change in Burma uh, and for real peace and real transform transformation. Uh, uh, for Burma, uh, uh, we uh, you know I hope that we uh, we can work together. Uh, we can come up with some good actions. Uh, and uh, you know uh, for our friends in the international community, I know uh, just uh, let us know if you need our help to for for you guys to help us. You know uh, you know uh, we work together. You know uh, sometimes in order to help someone, you need their help. Uh, so we we here to to help you to help us. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, all of you for the attention uh, and th this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And Myra, I um, I would be remiss without giving you a few moments. Myra Dagapal from uh, U.S. Campaign for Burma, who put this helped put this event together as well. So I'm going to let you bring us home. Thank you. Close it down. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, we are three months late from our expected original plan to launch this report because of the security concern, because of the internet cuts, hard communicate with our colleagues on the ground. But finally, here we are, we made it. And like Nene said, our partners who risk their lives and collecting all this information supposed to be here with us, but also again, due to 
the military's um, tactic, trying to put everything uh, in their place, trying to silence us. And that is why we have to have Nene who can uh, come out uh, easier than our other partners. But does that mean that are we going to be quiet? No, we're not going to be quiet. And uh, I just wanted to let us all know that the people in Burma, we all know, they're willing to do anything to risk their lives, which they've been doing. And therefore, it is also our responsibility to join in solidarity in anything we can do in order to amplify their voices and to bring out the actions that we can bring out wherever, which position you are, we are. It is our responsibility to do it together. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to say that um, we, UUSC and USCB have a very little role here, not risking our lives, but uh, we're so honored to be a part of this report. And I just wanted to making it know that uh, the full report and uh, the full executive summary um, will, can be found on the USC, yeah, the UUSC, Unitarian Universalist Service Committee website, and all other, our, our partners, and I'm pretty sure also on USIP website. So that's where you can also get the full report. And uh, with that, I just wanted to say thank you to, to USIP, to Ambassador Kelly, to everyone who comes in today, in person or in Zoom. We really uh, greatly appreciate your support. And I just wanted to say good afternoon. Be well. Thank you. Well, with that, I guess we're adjourned. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. And thanks to our panelists.